I'm not a podium person. I do, however, have a bit of musical training. And this way I have audience, I have history, and I'm going to keep you awake because I am the only thing between you and lunch. Are we ready? Yes, please. No, no, no. That's not audience participation. Are we ready? Yes. Thank you. First off, thanks to the Goodwin Nearing Center, who were crazy enough to invite a New Englander to come and talk about the Southwest. And I will start off by saying apologies to the Southwest, because I'm going to raise some questions they would probably rather I not mention. So with that as a bit of a controversial start, here we go. The first question you should be asking me is what cities are we going to study and which cultures? Because the Southwest has a period, has a history of urbanization that stretches across millennia. This is from the Fremont culture. Um, we have beautiful rock art from them. You may be familiar with Chaco Canyon. At its high point, there were approximately 4,000 living in the canyon, which is a 20 uh, mile approximately 20 miles in length, with 20,000 people in the nearby area. Many people are familiar with the famous cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde. This area was um, lived in for generations on top of the cliff, on top of the mesa, as well as in the cliffs. Acoma is a pueblo that continues to be lived in today. The picture at left, lower, is from the Denver Art Museum and really depicts the strength of this city which endured against a number of foreign incursions. But I think that Pecos National Monument gives us something particularly interesting to think about with southwestern urbanization. Um, Cicuye was the original Pueblo. Um, folks moved there from the Rio Grande Valley. And you can see from the circle areas um, in the plan on the left, these are the kivas. Pictures provided on the right. So this was also a highly religious and, and spiritually oriented center. And it continued to be that way after the Spanish arrived and established a mission. This was a mission church, um, Our Lady of the Angels of Puerto Nucula. Um, and the roof beams weighed several tons. The walls were up to seven feet thick. Now, what you want to see is the computer modeling on the right makes this look kind of like neighbors. When the actual fact of the matter is, and you can see it from a souvenir picture at lower left, that one, or one community was imposed over the other. And this is the definition of conquering, of course. This is cultural um, accommodation in, in reality. So when we study the Southwest urban development and designs, what we're really studying are a series of cultures as, and one displacing the next. And oftentimes, one having to abandon its, its environment in favor of an alternative space. So the impact of human environmental factors, the dynamics of climate change, the vulnerabilities that are posed by trade, um, the workings of religion and politics to sustain what are ultimately environmentally dysfunctional practices, um, external pressures from <coughs> opposing um, military forces, all of these things were working in the so-called prehistorical period of the Southwest. All of them make urbanization in the Southwest particularly fascinating. However, I thought we should study the cities that our present day culture has established. And to that end, I'm working with Phoenix, Salt Lake City, and Las Vegas. You have to do Vegas. <laughs> now, the bottom line is, as Mike Davis said, these cities have wonderful, deadly sins, okay? Um, that would be a problem for Salt Lake City, of course, that's the, the Vatican, so to speak, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it's not so much of a problem for Vegas because they can glory in it, okay? And in between, we have Phoenix that simply endures. Now, the smart growth principles, all 10 of them, provide nice, neat answers for each of those sins. In fact, they provide penances. <laughs> I'm continuing the metaphor, it's not mine, okay? So we have a sin, negligible public space, and we have a penance, preserve open space. And we can simply go through all of these things, but to do that is to neglect what a sin actually is. It's deliberate. It's done with thought. It's done with an awareness of harm. And so as a result, 
we really can't just expect people to roll over and change. They're perfectly comfortable. There's something to be said for sin, right? Now, therefore, why sin? What's the enthusiasm? Where is it coming from? What's the consistency? And the reason that I would argue we need to do this is because the Southwest is really more obvious and straightforward in its judgments. These actions are mimicked throughout the United States. So I have three questions. Why are these sins so attractive? Can we expect reforms? And then what lessons do we learn? I am arguing in this presentation that what we actually see in the Southwest, and by extension throughout the United States, is a collision of two archetypal myths. Now, I don't mean myth in the fluffy sense. I mean myth in the sense that this is how we organize and think through concepts. It's a narrative that gives us meaning and, con and, and significance. And in that light, I'm identifying the city as civilization as one of those myths and looking at three facets of how cities have embodied um, civilization through sacred space, through imperial culture, and through economic utopias. In due course, I'll come to the second myth, which is the idea of the desert as wasteland. That these are environments that we can really dismiss and set aside, or better yet, recreate and reclaim. And the collision of a city as civilization and a desert as wasteland, why would you want to preserve waste? You process it. Um, you do something with it, you don't preserve it. So it's entirely understandable that cities would triumph and um, follow their own practices of sinning and virtue. So let's start with the city of civilization. And in keeping with throwing rocks at my own, I'm going to start with Boston, which is pretty much where I'm from, from the outside suburbs. Of course, we have in Boston this very big tradition of the Puritans. Um, we've rewritten a great deal of it. And as a result, um, Boston, the city on a hill, taken from the John Winthrop sermon, who in turn was referencing Jesus Christ, of course, right? So on the, sh the deck of the Arabella, he declaims, we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. And that religious initiative continues today. You can see it very clearly. Old North Church, um, this is a church that is the oldest practicing, um, it's, the, it's the oldest active church in Boston. Those Episcopalians hang in there. It's a Christopher Wren church, beautifully done, okay? Um, Mary Baker Eddy founded the Christian Scientists in Boston. This is the first church of Christ Scientists, a beautiful structure. Boston University's Marsh Chapel. Um, this is the Martin Luther King Memorial in front of it. Of course, Martin Luther King Jr. went to theological school in Boston. We're very proud of him, we claim him. Um, this is a small medieval uh, cathedral which is meant to bring integrity and strength to a campus that spreads across the city. Trinity Church, consecrated in 1877, Richardsonian Romanesque. That alone makes it sound special. Um, it is considered among the ten most significant buildings in the United States by the American Institute of Architects. It is the only building to have stayed on their list continuously since 1885. And you'll see, just looking at this picture from 1875 and then the postcard from 1920, it was intended to dominate the space in which it was built. Inside, it is designed to give spatial expression to the preaching of Phillips Brooks, um, who presided at the time it was built and who has since been canonized as a saint. The problem is that the John Hancock Insurance Company wanted to build a skyscraper at Copley Square. It was 400, it is 490 feet and 60 stories tall, and dwarfs the 211 feet, oh, excuse me, 790 feet, 60 stories, and it dwarfs the 211 feet of Trinity Church. So what are you going to do? God and mammon, mammon wins? I think not, right? So if you look, can you see that line that runs up and down the Hancock? IMK inserted that line. It's a break in the building, a break in the glass wall. And it is done to bring your eye from the heavens to God's home on earth, Trinity Church. And then from Trinity Church, which is reflected in the building and proves its dominance,
over corporate structures, you trace back up to the heavens. Yes. It may be apocryphal, but we all believe it in Boston. And you know what? That makes it irrelevant whether it's true, because we're sure that's the truth, okay? We make it the truth. Now, if we continue on, I know it's pixelated, but it was the best I could find. This is the view of Copley Square from the steps of Trinity Church. And that big building that you're seeing on the left is the Boston Public Library, built in 1895 in a Renaissance revival Beaux-Arts style. And then, of course, we have to have another church. So this is, and it is its name, the New Old South Church with that tower. Okay? Um, and that is in a northern Italian Gothic style. So we're really kind of mixing up our style. The thing I would draw your attention to is the fact that the library is actually echoing the church. So that we have a religion that is faith-based, and then we have, there's no fight between faith and intellect in Boston. We have religion that is based on learning. And Abby Van Slyke has done wonderful work on this. You see a reading room here, which is a temple of the intellect. You see a monastic garden, that's the inner courtyard for the Boston Public Library. And my personal favorite, you see, um, this is the finals in, in the, the mosaics that are in the uh, library. This is Sir Galahad returning the Holy Grail to heaven escorted by angels, the holy grail of knowledge. So, we're looking at a system um, of, of urban planning in which churches and religions are able to gain pride of place um, and location, 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 and then to continue that expression of their faith through incarnation that is architecture. Right? So the city is civilization. If that's sacred space, let's turn to imperial culture. I'm a political scientist. I really enjoy studying power. I'd rather um, know what's coming at me. Um, the law of the Indies was a codification for urban planning that was developed successively across um, the Spanish Empire. Um, the, the codification that's most important, I think, for the United States um, and our region, the modern United States, was developed in 1573 by King Philip II. And it set out the guidelines for creating towns. And as you can see, there's to be a central plaza with roads radiating out from it, um, public buildings in the central plaza, and then um, merchants buildings, and so forth and so on. So this was smart growth in 1573. And it looked somewhat like this. The palace of the governors built in 1610, and you know, I've got a, the, the net does such great things. They had a whole section on the palace of the governors for children. And the way that they explained it was, the construction permit for this building was written by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And I just had a vision of the Queen and King writing the construction permit. So, there we go. Um, and then, of course, Santa Fe. You've heard of the Santa Fe uh, Trail. It ends at Santa Fe, so here's the memorial for it. This is the plaza today. It continues. It's very much reflecting the Spanish, um, the empire impact that, that was started then. Now, rule number 134 um, from the Law of the Indies was, quote, they shall try as far as possible to have buildings all of one type for the sake of the beauty of the town. And that has continued in Santa Fe. This is the Museum of Art built in 1917 in the same Pueblo revival style that you saw a moment ago in the Palace of the Governors. So, we're no longer part of the empire, Spanish that is, but we're going to continue the rules and guidelines. And this continues and continues and continues, so that we now have what's referred to as the Santa Fe style. And Chris Wilson has done a brilliant analysis of this, and he notes about, he describes how it's broken into design components, which you then can kind of, you take a cultural fragment from another period, right? And then you stick it, well, He's much kinder than I am. You place it in an ahistorical romantic context. We're going to drop what the conquistadors were actually doing in terms of pacification. Um, and we're just going to focus on the beauty, right? The ahistorical beauty. And then we are going to kind of 
create a nostalgic story that wraps its way around this. And you have to say, it's, I'm not sure that I'm terribly fond of all of those roofs, but it's a beautiful set of shop fronts. And the Santa Fe style has been extremely popular. Um, it's created quite a number of best-selling authors and books. So if you think about this as a showcase for imperial um, power, what we're looking at is, is cultural imprints that are so forceful that they're able to erase, even obliterate what came before. And then sustain themselves through the future. There's a buy-in process. I want to be very clear, I'm not suggesting, I'm not ignoring the level of resistance to all of this. I'm simply pointing out that there are times when, despite great resistance, power endures. Hegemons win. Um, and that is what we're observing in these, in these cities. So, economic utopias. The more common, familiar uh, expression or, or depiction of the city on this issue is going to be that of the anti-utopia, industrialization as destruction. Um, and, of course, at the end of the 1800s, um, you see an entire movement dedicated to recognizing the horrors of industrialization. Um, whether it's through settlement house work, through green space movements, or on Miyako Brice's pieces, um, documentary photography regarding how the other half lives. But we heard about um, the New York World's Fair of 1939. There's the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. This was the world's Columbian exposition. It was intended to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's arrival, one year late. Okay? Um, this picture in particular, it was 600 acres on the waterfront of Chicago. This, in the back, you see the women's building, which was designed by Sophie Hayden. Uh, she was the first woman granted an architectural degree by MIT. Um, it was one of 14 great buildings, one of 200 buildings that were designed um, for this event, which was conducted over a period of six months and had 27 million visitors in the midst of a depression. So we seem to time our world's fairs for points at which people require a refuge. Now, the thing that I would stress about this, and here's the map so you can see how extensive it is, is that this was described as the white city. All of the buildings were white, and it had street lights that made them gleam regardless of time of day or the weather. And that is a very important point because it was sending a distinct message about what kind of urban environment we value. Orderly, policed, clean, racially pure. Now, Catherine Lee Bates, who is the author of America the Beautiful, was very active in the settlement house movement. She knew exactly what price cities and industrialization were exacting from many, many individuals. And so when she wrote, Thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears, it was not out of ignorance as to what was really going on in the cities. That alabaster is an adjective that qualifies. The white city gleams undimmed by human tears. And this is what was marketed as a hope for cities. Right? So what you're looking at is a fantastical element, but this is the Colombian World Exposition. And you can see the influence of classical design, of European design. Um, those who lost the bid to design the World's Fair said that it would set back American architecture for 50 years. It may not have set back architecture for 50 years, but it definitely influenced it. The City Beautiful movement grew directly out of this World's Fair. And it argued that aesthetics would provide a kind of morality and civic education that would safeguard civilization. So this is Grant Park in 1929, a direct result of the City Beautiful movement. And I know it's pixelated, but I have to tell you, this is a plan for Telegraph Hill. And it was to turn it into this beautiful kind of um, fairy tale 
because the designer for the San Francisco City Beautiful program was actually the same designer as the Chicago Exposition <coughs> Fair. And he felt that really San Francisco had the potential to be a hilly Paris. So, um, if we usually think of cities as a site of social unrest, disease, and death, might as well go right to the bottom line, um, there's actually an alternative perspective that these can be communal expressions of opportunity and hope. The question is who's included in that opportunity and whose hopes are granted primacy. So there's one set of myths, and kind of like an Italian dinner, or elderly, right? Um, I'd like you to let that kind of simmer. There's the sauce, very, very rich. And now, the pasta, the desert. So if we want to think of a desert as a place of holiness and beauty, where can you do better than to start with the New Testament? We'll continue on this tradition of, of focusing on Judeo-Christian um, Judeo uh, beliefs. Um, this is the Judean desert. As far as histor biblical historians can tell, this is where Christ wandered when he needed to be reflective. Okay? Um, I added in the Negev with a few camels because we're at Connecticut College. That's our mascot. Okay? Um, camels are very reflective creatures when they aren't being difficult. Um, we move forward to the reflective dynamic in the United States. This is from Arches National Park, and those of you who are familiar with Ad Edward Abbey know that he really discussed the importance of reflection and held out very strongly for it in all of his books, particularly Desert Solitaire. He was a ranger at Arches National Park. The slot canyons that run by the, by, um, the, the Colorado River. This is um, Antelope, one of the most famous. And Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. Um, artists who have celebrated the American deserts include Ansel Adams, Georgia O'Keeffe, not just with skulls, but also with landscapes. Okay, and I think in many ways, whoops, most movingly, Alan Hauser, um, a Chiricahua Apache who has really celebrated the desert peoples. So, M. Scott Mamaday, who is a, a Navajo, a Diné, um, has stated that, that the awareness and relationship to the land is very much a part of one's spirituality and one's humanity as something that extends beyond the self. So there's the holiness and beauty facet of the desert as wasteland. More frequently, the desert is viewed as um, something that needs to be fixed and reclaimed. So here we have on the map that shows you the extent to which our nation is a desert nation. We have the Chihuahuan, Sonora, Mojave, and Great Desert Basin, um, Great Basin Deserts, okay? And just the color of that map kind of makes you flinch a little bit, okay? So the response to that has been to um, what Donald Worcester describes as a modern hydraulic society. He states there is no freedom for nature and little social freedom in this world. We've taken a great river and turning it into a, turned it into a plumbing system, where rivers become funnels and reservoirs are containers and spigots are water projects and drips are waste. The bureau that's been placed in charge of, of that plumbing system is the Bureau of Reclamation. And this is their great seal, which really summarizes their optimism. If you look behind the dam, you see the lake with green hills and snowpack, and in front of the dam, irrigation and flood control. And Hoover Dam, of course, is one of their showcases. This is Lake Mead. Now, there are no reservoirs in the southwest. There are merely lakes behind dams. Got it? So. Um, this is one of the things that the Southwest would have issues with me. But Lake Mead is quite an extraordinary lake. It is so big that when, it was, when the dam was completed and the lake was filled, it buckled the crust of the earth and continues to cause earthquakes. Um, the dam itself was designed to really showcase American nationalism. You can see the influences of Art Deco in its elevator doors, for example. They are gold. Um, its face, which is a very modernistic approach, um, and then, of course, we incorporate the Native American symbols. But I find it telling that those are incorporated in the floor, so they are walked on by visitors, of the turban room, which is, of course, the showcase for American power. This is the Memorial of 
cute at Hoover Dam. Um, it is on the Nevada side. And if you look at it in the lower left corner, you can see that this is the floor of the memorial with the great seal of the United States. It also has signs of the zodiac. Its message is the universality of the dam and the reclamation, the will to reclaim. I think the thing, oops, I also find it telling that when they wanted to record how important the dam was, on the floor of this is also a star map that records important dates in the history of humanity. And listen to the dates that were picked. The building of the pyramids, the birth of Christ, the dedication of Hoover Dam. <laughs> <laughs> the winged figures are 30 feet tall and they are meant to symbolize the universal aspirations of mankind, not gender inclusive when you look at the figures, okay? And the stoic disposition of those who settled the West, who have, quote, the look of eagles about them. Meanwhile, houseboating is very big on Lake Mead. Um, and there are a number of marinas, so this has become a major uh, recreation area. It also poses significant environmental challenges. You can see the bath ring very clearly, which is caused by calcification as the, as the lake drops. More generally and aerially, because not all the walls of the, the reservoir are so vertical, there's a process of withdrawing, and you can see these dead zones on the shore. You can also see the algae blooms with oxygen depletion and biotoxins, the inevitable result. Um, to see the extent of this, let me take you up to Lake Powell, which is the reservoir behind Glen Canyon Dam. And you can really see the extent to which calcification and, and dead zones have resulted. At Lake Mead, you have to find it humorous when there's no fishing in a desert. So, if the workers died to make the desert bloom, and you see here that they rise from the waters of Lake Mead into sheaves of wheat, the question is, why should a desert bloom? And it doesn't need to, we can simply destroy it. These, this is the landscape around the Trinity site, which is the first site for um, atomic testing. In 1945, the day the sun rose twice. This explosion was so extraordinary, it turned the land into glass. This is Trinitite, and it continues to be radioactive today when the site is opened, despite extensive treatment. So here's a picture of, of the glass zone in 1945 and a picture of the glass zone in 1996. And what you can see is the harsh edges are a fence, but you can still see the impact of the glass, which is quite pronounced. That's not the only place, New Mexico's not the only place, of course, for, for missile testing, uh, for atomic testing. We also have Nevada. I kind of like the alien, I have to admit. The Nevada test site, of course, was the site of above ground testing um, from 1951 to 1962. Um, you didn't have to be in the Army to get to go and see an atomic test. Vegas marketed vacation packages for atomic testing from your hotel. Um, the Atomic Energy Commission issued um, reassurances on all fronts stating, quote, we find no basis for concluding that harm to any individual has resulted from radioactive fallout. They've since recanted. <laughs> when we aren't testing, we're dumping. This is Yucca Mountain, which is a sacred mountain within the, the testing site area. Um, it is now um, the location for a deep geologic depository for nuclear waste. Under the current administration, it is closed after much opposition. And then finally, we can always mine it. Um, if you, you'll notice the permit number is one. This is Peabody Western Coal Company at Black Mesa, which is Hopi Sacred Lands. Um, and it has occasioned tremendous opposition from two sets of two cultural communities that don't usually agree about much, namely the Hopi and the Navajo. This is the coal that powers Las Vegas. So, this final quote, just briefly, from Terry Tempest Williams, re recounting her father's memory of an atomic blast. Um, 
She describes herself as a member of the clan of one-breasted women because virtually all of the women in her family have had radical mastectomies and have died of breast cancer. They all live downwind. So what happens when we bring civilization into the wasteland? Well, three case studies. This is the Great Basin Desert. Time for audience participation. Any maple trees? No. Any oak trees? No. Elm trees? No. Remember that. Here we have Salt Lake. It's beautiful. It sits in the shadow of the Wasatch, which ensure that it's going to get a little bit of precipitation. You can see the spires of the Great Temple in the right-hand corner. Um, that's a temple square. Okay. Um, it is the product of deliberate and careful migration, um, forced out of Illinois by lynchings, barn burnings, and murders. Um, the Latter-day Saints traveled across and left the United States across the territories, leaving the United States to establish their own country in Desiree. They considered themselves in many ways expatriates, even as they talked about establishing their own country. And they worked very hard. They were Midwesterners and New Englanders, and they sought to recreate the world they had known to the glory of God. This is a very good and very representative picture of Temple Square. It is the Great Temple, a truly extraordinary building. Maples, oaks, elms. This is an entirely recreated and reclaimed desert. So when we think about the angel Moroni leading Joseph Smith to find the golden plates, this is a very important element of the faith practice. Okay? We also, and this is something that, that the church and also the, the state government has had to come to terms with, um, in recreating the environment has created a level of, of environmental destruction. Utah was the only um, Rocky Mountain state to be part of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. By 1950, 20 watersheds throughout the Wasatch were flooding and approximately 15 towns had to be abandoned. So they have a continuing challenge um, to confront from the mountains that they so value. Turning to Phoenix, um, saguaro cactus, right? Any palm trees? Now this is audience participation. I'm giving you a chance. Any palm trees? No. Well, better. No palm trees. Remember that. So here we have Phoenix. This is the city logo. And it's well named because it rises from the ashes of previous civilizations, or considers itself to do that. I'm not sure previous civilizations see themselves as ashes. Um, this is from an artist's depiction of the, 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 one of the great sites um, from the Hohokam culture. Hohokam were just phenomenal canal builders. Um, they had the largest irrigation complexes of the time in America, and um, among the largest that has ever been seen um, on our planet. Um, you can see here, just this is just the Gila River Canal Complex. And Phoenix has gone it one better. This is the canal diversion, the Central Arizona Project, um, which brings water from the Colorado River in the upper left-hand corner, 336 miles, all the way to Phoenix and Tucson in the lower right-hand corner. Now, I want you to really appreciate this. Um, I know that Doug Thompson has talked about this a lot. You see those things that look like salt shakers? Those are pumping plants, so you can pump water uphill. And then you see those kinds of, like, blue dots? Those are dams, so that we can reinforce the water from the Colorado. And then we've got um, a couple of, oh, and also the red lines, okay? And then since it's easier sometimes to simply go through the earth than to pump it over that hill, those gray things are tunnels. This is an extraordinary event. Um, to really accomplish it in, in the, the 51, no, 21 years, not bad. It's an open air canal in a desert. Problem would be, Evaporation. Thank you. Really looks nice in the moonrise. So how do you spend the water? Well, let me say at the front that Phoenix does make good use of groundwater, extensive use of groundwater, to the extent that it's depleting its aquifer and has to deal with subsidence. My field is surface water, so I went straight for capped. 
Um, but the way that you spend it is palm trees, remember, right? Um, and various other forms of green grass and, and delightful, really beautiful environments that have nothing to do with the Sonoran, which incidentally is the most biodiverse of all of the deserts. They have a lot to work with. They're choosing not to in terms of beauty. Because you can always have a golf course. There are over 250 golf courses in the Phoenix area. Now, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it takes seven acre feet per, to keep the grass green on a golf course. So I'm five foot, so you have this much water, dink dink, in order to support each golf course. And we have over 250 of them in the Phoenix area. Because of course, you want to golf in the desert. So the result of all of this is a new <coughs> ecosystem um, with extended problems, okay? Now part of that smog is caused by transportation and the like, but a significant portion of it is the reality that the plants that have been brought into Phoenix now have pollen. Desert plants, there was only one plant native to the Sonoran that had pollen. So the people who used to go to Phoenix and to Arizona for respiratory aid can no longer find it there for respiratory health. I saved Vegas to last. You have to go with the fantastic last. Do you see any water? No. That was a trick question. <laughs> in the clouds. There's a teeny little bit of snow packing, yes, in the clouds, okay? Um, but this is not green. So here's the strip, all right? Um, you know, you've got to just enjoy the strip, I suppose. It's unincorporated land. Uh, it's owned by the, the casino developers and casino owners, and they govern the strip which includes Treasure Island. Of course, our pirates wear fishnet stockings, right? Millions of gallons, so these ships can go up and down and, and have battles and explosions. In the first 10 years, there were 10,000 shows and 100 million visitors saw them. This is the 11-acre pool at Mandalay Bay, which also has a shark reef aquarium. It's 1.6 million gallons of water, and it generates waves of two to four feet every 90 seconds. You can go to the beach in the desert. The Venetian experience a masterpiece. <coughs> and of course, the Bellagio, familiar to all of us from Ocean's Eleven. This is an eight-acre lake. Um, the fountains cost $40 million to design. The shows are every 15 minutes in the evening, um, every 30 minutes in the afternoon. When we head for the desert with the Luxor and the Sphinx, we still have to have our water. And of course, we're going to golf. Golf is just such an amazing sport to me. Um, golf and skiing, I think of skiing as golf courses for winter. Um, and the, the greenness of here against the, the mountains is really quite extraordinary. Um, this is Red Rock Golf Community, one of the most famous. And that clip art is from the real estate um, agent who sells the, the community. They're very enthusiastic. So here's what we have if you take the quick ride to your hotel on the strip um, from the airport. Um, and it's a tough environment, and it's one that has been has been extensively abused. So if we think about cities as civilization and we kind of consider civilization in a wasteland, um, let's go back to those three questions. Why are the seven deadly sins so attractive? Um, because in committing them, the residents who have economic and social resources, not all residents do, but those who have those resources are able to affirm their most important values. They sin because in sinning they feel virtuous. Um, can we expect them to reform and embrace smart growth principles? This is building on the points that other folks made about this is actually a cultural issue and a cultural problem. Um, no, not until the culture changes, not until values are re-examined, um, not until there's a sense of virtue as opposed to resignation that comes from being strong and thoughtful. So what lessons do we learn? Um, well, first off, I'm going to suggest give up all appeals to logic Give up all appeals to community and give up, you know there's, there's environmental scarcity out there, don't you? Because as far as the sinners are concerned, they are logical, they have community standards, and scarcity is something to be beat, 
not to be accepted. So if you're not going to try those appeals, I would recommend instead that you give due recognition to the power of historical inertia, to the strength of identity, and to the force of nationalism. And more specifically, that you think about achieving these three goals. First, um, and this goes back to the question you asked, asked yesterday, find a way for urbanization to show the need and value of an environmentally protected standard of sustainability so that we aren't simply compromising, we aren't giving up. Second, educate those who are privileged by technology to their privilege. It's something that most of us would prefer to ignore um, about technology, that it creates haves and have-nots at extraordinary and diverse levels. And third, um, create a definition, a, a creed of responsible urban environmentalism that is widely shared, self-reflective, and critically engaged. And that is a problem for the ages. Thank you.